everyone, welcome to Bread and Roses. I'm Marin Amazi. And I'm Fadi Bors Kuria. And this week we are drinking plenty of Prosecco and drink in solidarity with people who are under pressure in month of Ramadan. Yes, it's the bleak month of Ramadan again. People keep saying happy Ramadan. We say miserable Ramadan. And in solidarity with people who defy fasting. Yes. This week's interview is with Muhammad Al Khadra. Jordanian atheists on atheism in Middle East. We'll also be having an insane fatwa on, guess what, Ramadan. And our slice of life is of women's unveiling movement in Iran, the White Wednesdays, and a wonderful protest that is... Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs> Ramadan has begun again and of course you know all we hear is happy Ramadan and what we can say they say Ramadan Karim and we like to say Ramadan Kari which is miserable Ramadan it and is. it's really miserable month it's a dark month really it's part of those uh, uh, um, times that the Islamists try to impose the will on society by different means where they can by rules and regulation and threat and police and prison and security where they don't have the power try to sort of try to do the exactly the same thing in a friendly way and compel pe people to actually uh, respect uh, the Islamic rules and regulation yeah. which is a horrible thing yeah. to do. They keep talking about respect I mean I want to say you know why don't you respect my right not to fast you know why are you fasting you're disrespecting my right to fast it's always in defense of their rules and against yes. those who don't want to do it. And of no. course, lots of people are persecuted, which is why every Ramadan we defy fasting rules because we think it's important to remember all those people who are persecuted. Uh, and also, I mean, it's a huge health issue, isn't it? People not eating, not drinking water for 18 plus hours in some of the hottest, uh, you know, uh, climates in the world. It's just such a calamity for a lot of people and they impose it on children they force some children that are even in the schools in uh, in germany the teacher have said this is unhealthy and trying to defend they're trying to defend children and say look children should not be forced and children should not be fasting but you'll have the pressure of the Islamists and the media you'll see the bbc and the independent independent and other news uh, agencies trying to argue the case that oh there is no problem with fasting for young children no, it is is, 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 is health is issues uh, fasting is unhealthy for uh, not eating for many many hours uh, in a day and suddenly you stuff your face with gluttony and uh, uh, you know eating too much with is unhealthy completely unhealthy yeah it's interesting because they always say that you know it's great uh, they do fasting in order to show solidarity with people who are hungry but then there's this amount of gluttony that takes place when you know the sun goes down and people can eat what they want and in fact people gain weight during Ramadan yes, but during the day it's you know you just can't move anymore and why do you have to do that to, uh, to express solidarity with people who don't have any well go and support them set up charities exactly. and organization to uh, you know de deal with inequality in society which the slumists are one of the major uh, contributing factors in inequality in many societies and of course what happens is because of this pressure even here in the west i mean so many of uh, my friends talk about how you know the minute they go somewhere they're told are you fasting or you know sorry you you won't be able to eat uh, assuming that people are fasting and this pressure uh, for people to fast even children even pregnant women who are not really supposed to be fasting anyway people who are traveling who are not supposed to be fasting people who are sick and nonetheless this pressure that they do it and so a lot of people hide food or pretend they're fasting when they're not really yeah, but these islamists have power and is that social pressure people are hiding and that's not good you know for people to pretend you know to do something else and that's you know creates us sometimes silly situations yeah definitely <laughs> yeah i mean it was very funny when i lived in the sudan uh, in the 80s i was sitting with one of my uh, christian friends sudanese christian and we were eating uh, you know our lunch together in his office and uh, this uh, big shot guy comes in from from the um, organization who I didn't know, so I wasn't sure what his position would be. So, you know, I had food, I, I was picking up a, a, 
a morsel to eat. And then I, I was like, oh, here you go, Joseph, have your food, as if I was feeding him. And then after the guy left, we were laughing because we said, most probably I'll get stoned for having some sort of illicit <laughs> relationship feeding someone rather than just saying I, I'm eating. And there is all that pressure, yes. isn't there? Which, which makes it even worse. And it, it, pressure also here in the West, yes. you hear about people uh, feeling, feeling those pressures. And you, you tr they try to give you know justification and silly sort of scenarios that uh, people have, uh, and the reason for how good this is, either refer to uh, Islamic te text or they refer, refer to uh, incidents and the stories to justify this horrible month and, and practice. So you've heard about there's a, there's a couple of hadiths and things. One is where you know Muhammad is asked to come up this mountain and he hears these people howling and he asks why are these people howling and it says uh, you know uh, uh, then I was taken I saw people hanging by their hamstrings with the sides of their mouth torn and oh. blood pouring from their mouths and I said who are these and he said these are the people who broke their fast before it was time. A minute earlier. This is what happens to you. So it's but not even God those loves you. who are drinking. God loves you. This is just for you. You know, he loves you. And he's the best thing. He's, you know, the most magnificent and merciful. A minute but earlier. It's like, yeah, it's bad. This is what just, happens to you. This is just like... So better not to just do it. At least sadistic, it, you know, very God sadistic, this is. Very sadistic. Yes. And of course, there's another one, which is interesting because you know how they keep talking about how fasting is the pillar of uh, one of the five pillars of Islam and it's to show compassion and all. And if you look at the text, for example, it's Allah saying, I want you to fast for me. And if you do it for me, then you will be rewarded. And there's Sin, one. He's very selfish. He's so, he's so self-centered. Selfish self God. Selfish he's so self-centered. Yes. And there's one part where he says, you know, the smell of the mouth of someone who's been fasting, which we know is not a pretty sight, is better than, you know, the most fragrant musk. And, you know, we got to call it, he's lying, isn't he? Yes, because it's disgusting and it's smelly. That is just not Terrible. possible. Yes. Even food, God must have his limits. Eat your food, brush your teeth, <laughs> and eat no stupid religious <laughs> ceremonies and rules and regulation. Ramadan is stupid, is <laughs> unfriendly, is unhealthy, is oppressive. Don't do it. And I mean, uh, oppression. And if they always refer to the fact that uh, uh, Ramadan and, and fasting is, there's no compulsion. No compulsion. There's no compulsion in anything. But everywhere you look, you know, there's compulsion. You look at... Uh, you, you try to do that in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Saudi Arabia. No compulsion, seriously. In some places, in Britain even, no compulsion, really. In Iran? What happens to Iran? Iran, it's, uh, you know, three flogging, lashes. And three months in prison. In pr up to three months in prison. In uh, Morocco, one to six months in prison. In Pakistan, up to three months in prison. Seriously, there is a lot of persecution going on of people who don't want to fast. So it's important, I think, to defy fasting. Yes. And in solidarity with people who... Uh, who do not fast and who are persecuted and uh, flogged, imprisoned uh, and, you know, all daily on the street, actually yeah. hit There are police in many countries who go around and if there's any signs, they hit people on the street. It's yeah. so oppressive and medieval. So that's why every Ramadan, what we do, we drink in solidarity and in objection to yeah. one month of bleak month of Ramadan and we celebrate uh, fast-defying activities across the globe. Yeah, and of course there are many fast-defying protests. There's one in London, for example, by the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. You've got uh, fast-defiers in places like Algeria and Morocco. And of course this is something that uh, people do without going to a protest. But they just drink and they eat as they normally would and they're persecuted for it. So we say long live fast-defying and no thank you for Ramadan. No, thank you. Cheers. Okay, welcome Muhammad Al Khadra. It's such a great pleasure to have you. I wanted to speak to you first about something you said at a recent conference. You said they're killing us and all you talk about is Islamophobia. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah. The main concern as is, as I've seen like I I, I thought that uh, us being targeted to be killed 
is the most uh, thing that the people who are secular and people who, uh, who are humanists are uh, and either left or right uh, that they are concerned about. But then when I came there, everybody was talking about the Islamophobia and how can we judge Islam and how what's allowed to be said and what's not allowed to be said. And they give it so much of their time and so much of their energy that I just wish like why isn't this energy focused on saving lives rather than buying into this propaganda being sold to people just to silence them and I, I, and then I found out that there are like two sorts of people there are ones who are simply afraid of the reaction that will come to them when they criticize Islam and there are other people who are just uh, have fell into the self-guilt and self-shaming of the West that they think that if only we can be nice to everybody else this will save us all and solve all, all of our problems well one of the problems is that people are getting put to death for this and being nice doesn't solve it out because uh, and I don't mean being intolerant to individuals but being intolerant to an intolerant in the ideology is the most approach that I see probable in this. I mean it's interesting because the point you're making the fact that it seems that criticism of Islam is worse than killing people in a way you know and that's exactly what you uh, put your finger on. Yeah, because uh, it's just like uh, nobody would give you a medal for for something you shouldn't be like we are we all shouldn't be racist we all shouldn't be bigots so we don't have to just buy into whatever individual asks for us just for the sake of looking this way uh, standing up for people who are being imprisoned and butchered with machetes is, is something much more noble to do and I don't see that in here uh, I've seen it with some organizations some movements but most of, uh, of the left or the uh, they, they just believe that we, if we can only just uh, tolerate this it's gonna all go away well even if it goes away here in, in the West it, it won't go away in the Middle East we don't hear Islamophobia in the Middle East like if I say that I'm, I'm an atheist and I criticize Islam in Jordan nobody will accuse me of being an Islamophobe they will just lock me up or do something to me and that's uh, the point isn't it that the situation is really bad for atheists and apostates and blasphemers in Jordan the Middle East North Africa tell us a bit about the situation for those who are considered apostates and blasphemers well, it's, it's mostly dangerous for women, but it's for both genders as well. And uh, what I say is for, like for women, for example, it's like a, a strike to the honor of the family just to leave Islam. So it's something much more dangerous for a woman because you can be easily killed for that, just for the honor. Add to that uh, being an apostate, it doubles the dangers. And I've seen cases where I like kidnapped a, a girl to get her into family protection and she had uh, glass all over her face, like glass cuts and a bruise here. And when we got to the family protection, the, the policeman said, well, this girl has a hijab on her ID card. Can you please get a hijab for this girl? This was the first answer. They, they weren't like concerned about this. Because who is she? Like, like, why did she leave her family? So uh, for, for either genders, it's a lot more difficult as well, based on the society, not just the government. Because it takes just one madman with, a, with a, this ideology to believe that he can go to heaven for killing you. And people used to joke with me at work, like, we can go and drink and do whatever, but at least we have Muhammad in the store, we can come and kill him and go to heaven. So uh, th they don't see that as something that could hurt you emotionally. And once you get over the threats and everything, you begin to be used to that. But uh, then there are people who are actually being killed, like like not hot or dead, and uh, just uh, and with the government, you can lose your civil rights. Uh, there uh, there was a convert, I think, in 2005 or six. Uh, he converted to Christianity. To, he wasn't even an atheist, and they did that lawsuit against him, and he was. Uh, they broke his marriage, and he can't inherit. He can't do any civil papers in the country. 
and it's not that bad as Saudi Arabia or Iran, for example, but uh, still, where, where, wherever this ideology is spreading and it has power to dictate in politics, you give it a hand to do this to people in anywhere and in any place. Once it's considered acceptable to to judge or imprison or prosecute apostates, uh, it's fairly reasonable within the community to just have one guy being killed for being so. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people have this impression that everything's fine in Jordan and Jordan's different from Saudi Arabia, but even there, there's great risks involved. And I guess uh, there's risks anywhere, as you say, that this movement I exists. So why did you feel then given that it's quite risky to start, uh, you know, a Jordanian atheist group and um, what made you want to do that? Well, uh, one of the reasons was I, I didn't get the idea about atheism or something if like someone like uh, Richard Dawkins wasn't public about his atheism. So if, if we are all public about it and out of the closet and just speaking out against it, we give people uh, just the idea of doubt and just the idea to think and we give others who are in the closet and can't speak out just give them a, a voice like you can speak for them so once you defend them especially here in the west when you have free speech once you defend them and do that you, you have the the ability to speak for us who can't speak uh, so the, the the need to have this community in Jordan came to give these people a sort of family because once you leave Islam you just you're detached from from whatever emotions you have for your family because a large part of your life is considered about the uh, concern uh, revolves around Islam so once you lose that you don't have anybody you can talk to and be like you so uh, after a year of work we, we got to the to finally establish a community for them. And now, when I wanted to do a council for ex-Muslims in Jordan, uh, I was uh, fairly sure that the government won't allow such a thing. And even the guys at the community were like, no, please don't uh, don't involve us in something like this that is so public because we're going to be prosecuted. Actually, when I finished my speech and I went back to Jordan, atheists actually messaged me and told me like we, uh, we're removing you from Facebook please delete our messages we can't be stay friends with you we love you and you have spoken for us but we can't have uh, being connected to you because if they get you they get all of us so uh, you, you can even lose your atheist friends for fear of prosecution uh, this is just in Jordan so you, you can multiply that a lot to, to get the image of Saudi Arabia or Iran as well and, and I guess that's one of the things that there's a lot more people than we know about because of exactly what you talk about. There's like, I've had meetings where there are 30, 40, 100, like in the, in the group I used to have above 100, like 100 to 10. Uh, uh, there are people who, like, I was so picky with the group. There are a lot of other individuals that didn't get them in. And there are old people. There, there's a popular singer who I can't say his name. He's an atheist. There's a, we have people in the parliament who are atheists and can't speak out. And one of them approached me and was just like, "I'm just like you, but I can't say this." And so, so you have people in power that they are afraid. Like uh, these people, in, especially in a in a not so democratic country these people should have the power to say whatever they wish nobody will get to them but they're so afraid of the reaction of the society that even a parliament member can not say that what's his religious views and, and can't criticize Islam. What, what do you what do you hope will happen I mean um, what sort of support do you think people should be giving what changes do you wish you know for and are you fighting for basically well, one of the changes that I hope with is, especially in Bangladesh and Pakistan, Iran and Saudi Arabia, these are the most dangerous countries, is that people who are trying to get away, that they can get the help uh, and the support they can. And I know that there are so many organizations that, that do this help, but there's so many of them. And there's the problem is, is increasing, it's not decreasing. Uh, especially with the numbers rising and there's also the pressure 
on these governments to change their laws and to stop this uh, persecution but still you need to have a, some kind of reform into education where the society changes his mind and allows secularism and allows people to think the way they what they wish so we need to start by uh, the voice here and the speech here to speak about this issue and raise awareness about it and for people in the Middle East to have a little bit of courage to show their faces, to speak out, uh, so that people in the West actually know that there is a problem. Yeah. And so there's this Atheist Coming Out Day, isn't there, um, that's being organized. Um, any news on that? Well, uh, the plan was, uh, because when I finished my speech, uh, there was a Christian girl, she, she broke down because of the prosecution she had in the U.S. for being an atheist from her family. So uh, I thought about having a day where we can protest all kinds of prosecution we have and all kinds of bigotry and all kinds of, of like, we, we uh, to normalize the world, to normalize ourselves, to be considered as human as people of faith are. For that, I, I said, like, maybe we can put a, a day, like, a, two years from now or one year from now, where everybody can celebrate being an atheist, celebrate being an ex-Muslim uh, in their certain city. And uh, and uh, I hope that by doing this in one day, because you have cases and movements uh, th that happened in one state or one country, but you don't have an international day where everybody's talking about the same subject. I, th I think that will raise that awareness. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Insane Fatwa this week is about Ramadan and of course you gotta have the stupid ones and Ramadan has got plenty of stupid ones you know how shocking right? yes. they've got the worst ones I mean you wanna you wanna laugh at fatwas you go look at Ramadan, Ramadan fatwas. fatwas it's silly one of them says there's a poster by uh, produced by the Islamic uh, regime in Iran showing a man drinking water normal human activity and there's a big hole and fire in a belly because and you there's know, a quote from Muhammad yes. uh, saying that you know if uh, fasting is a shield uh, against the hellfire and yeah. I feel quite, my tummy feels ah, quite very, nice very, very good actually yes mm. prosecco makes it feel quite good so yes. I'm wondering if it's just water that sends you to the hellfire I don't know any any human activity sells you to fire, fire to hellfire exactly, yes. yes. But go there's on. a really bad one, which is, you know, we were contemplating whether we should say it or not. And we were like, go on, so then let's stupid. say it. Yes. But it's about, uh, you know, using a bidet after you go to the toilet. And if actually you use that and water goes up your anus, your fast is cancelled. So should we just leave it there? Because anything else that we say after this will just sound too gross and disgusting. You see how stupid the fatwa and the fatwa machinery is don't use a bidet it's dangerous if you're fasting don't drink the second the white wednesday movements you've heard about it masi ali nejad the journalist has been spearheading it and of course it is a widespread movement in iran against compulsory veiling. This is something that's happened for decades in Iran, but because of social media, we're getting to see the widespread uh, effect that this uh, rejection of compulsory veiling has and how many people are actually opposed to this compulsory veiling, not just women, but men as well. Absolutely, and children, and children. Every day, uh, young people, uh, women are f confronting the compulsory veiling and the misogynist Islamic regime. And in one of those incidents, one of the school children uh, what was cut because the school deemed that to be too long, that may inside the head of the school. And, that's and so, you know, this poor girl, she, her hair, imagine going to school, your hair being forcibly cut at the school. And so you've got school girls coming out and defending uh, the right to not be veiled. And again, one of the things that we see very clearly with this 
mass movement in Iran against compulsory veiling is that no, the veil is not empowering, no, it's not liberating. In many instances, in most instances, it's been imposed by sheer force, and yet women are nonetheless resisting it. And there's this wonderful video, isn't there? Yes, we, of schoolgirls doing exactly this. That we, we are going to bring a program to end with this uh, piece of video that shows liberation of women in Iran comes with end of compulsory veiling and misogynist Islamic regime in Iran. <laughs> But before we go off until next week, we'd like to again wish you happy fastifying during Ramadan. We hope you have lots of fastifying moments. And while you do, you remember all those who are persecuted for eating during Ramadan. Cheers. To you. Cheers. And goodbye. Have a good week. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo-breaking, free-thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.